Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. I'm Junior Doan and thank you for joining us. Today I'm with Shani Traska, Iditarod competitor, musher, dog sled trainer, and owner of Howland Ridge Kennel. Welcome Shani. I'm thrilled to have someone who is interested and participated in the Iditarod, but would you explain to me and the audience what it is? The Iditarod is a sled dog race in Alaska. It's a thousand miles long. It's held every March. Um, the teams are completely on their own out there as far as not allowed any outside assistance. It's you and the dogs out there. Um, the race began in the early 1970s as a way to kind of co commemorate the sled dog um, with the invention of the, the snow machine over the years, the use of sled dogs for actual transportation died out. And so a man by the name of Joe Reddington had this idea to run this thousand mile race to keep the sled dogs alive and to commemorate all that they had done throughout Alaskan history. Do you have to qualify for the race? You do. Um, you have to run two 300 mile races and a 200 mile race. Uh, there is a time frame, it's pretty large, so usually as long as you finish, you're going to make it into qualifying. But also while you're out there during these races, there's a team of vets at, along the trail at the different checkpoints, and they have to almost grade you and write a report card on your, your dog care. Um, so you have to, to show that you know how to care for your dogs and get a team of dogs um, healthy to the finish line. What kind of care do you have to give them during the race? What are they looking for? Right, there's a lot of care involved. Uh, whenever you stop to rest the team, again, you have to do all the work, all the care for the team by yourself. So we'll go up. Um, we actually put down straw on the snow so the dogs have some insulation. They'll just curl up on the straw to rest. Um, we'll check them over for any type of injuries. Usually they get little minors like or minor um, pulls or strains, just like a human athlete would. And so we just check them over, make sure they're staying nice and healthy out there. Uh, we have to feed them, water them, and just make sure everybody's mentally happy and, and healthy. So it takes a lot of time when you stop to rest to care for that team. And it must be a lot of weight to carry food and probably water and medical supplies with you. It can be. The good thing about it in these races is that beforehand we'll actually ship out food to the different checkpoints so oh. we can resupply as we go along. So we're not carrying everything for the whole race. Um, we definitely do carry food from checkpoint to checkpoint in case we do get stuck out there and need an emergency supply. Um, but typically we can just resupply as we go. How do you know where to go? Are there flags or? There are, yep, about every 50 yards or so, they'll have a little wooden marker. It's got flagging on it. Um, they've also got reflective strips because a lot of times we're running at night and we wear headlamps. And so that'll light up the trail, um, light up those reflective markers so we know where to go. Most of the time the races are well marked. Uh, so we it, are they relays in the sense that you go so many miles and, and rest for a while? How do they how do they do that thousand miles? Uh huh. In the Iditarod, it's totally up to each individual team oh. how far they want to run and rest each day. Uh, there are three mandatory rests throughout the course of the race. There's a 24 hour and two eight hour rests that you have to take. Other than that, it's totally up to each musher, as we're called. Uh, to decide how far we want to run and then how long we want to rest. Do you get to decide the number of dogs? Uh, you, you do. There's a, um, at the beginning of the Iditarod, the maximum you can start with is 16 dogs. Um, the least that you can finish with is five dogs. Um, so quite often just maybe a little injury or sickness will pop up and you'll have to leave a dog at a checkpoint. Um, so you'll lose dogs from the team and they're totally fine. Um, they just need some time to heal up. And someone takes the dog 
back to a safe space. Exactly, yep. Again, there's vets at every checkpoint, so the vets take good care of them. In the Iditarod, all of those dogs that are taken out of teams get flown back to Anchorage, which is the start of the race. Right. And then you've got a friend or family member there to come and pick up the dog and care for them. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> What, what muscles did you have to develop to do this kind of <laughs> work? Because I would imagine it takes a lot of, cause you're, how do you steer um, them? Do the dogs just follow a path? Is there a path? Right. Other than the markers? Before the race, they do go out with snow machines and create an actual trail for us. So okay. usually it's pretty well laid out. But at times we do have to direct the dogs and it's all by voice command. Um, so we'll just shout G means turn right and haw means left. So we just shout that um, and they'll steer the team. Uh, but we also have to maneuver the sled. Um, so it does take a bit of work on our part just to steer. It's almost like skiing for us. We just lean our bodies back and forth and that helps guide the sled. It's like luge, I mean, where your body weight is, is determining, so there's no no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's no steering wheel or right. yep, it's all it's by weight. Exactly. Yeah, by balancing. How artistic. Uh, yes. Yep. You have to get a little fancy at times. <laughs> yeah. How interesting. And you take care of the dogs when they're off season, so sort of off racing season in the dead of winter. Exactly. I read a little bit about this, but I want our audience to hear details. Oh, right, so right. <laughs> What is your life like with the dogs? Right. Okay. Um, it is a full-time job with these dogs. Um, my husband and I currently have 43 dogs. Almost all of them we've raised from newborn puppies, so we have a very special attachment to them. Uh, they are like our children. We love them very dearly. And in the summer months, we actually take our dogs to Juneau, Alaska, uh, which is down on the coast where a lot of the cruise ships come in. And we live on a glacier, so we're up in the mountains on this block of ice, and um, passengers that come in from the cruise ships will come up onto the glacier to take a dog sled tour. So it's great for us. It's how we make the majority of our income. Plus, the dogs are being exercised all summer, so it keeps them healthy and in really good shape. How long is the tour for, for a tourist? It's about a mile and a half ride, about 20 minutes to a half hour that they're out there. So they have new respect for you, I <laughs> bet. <laughs> a little achy when they get off. Yeah, yeah. So what happens when it's snowing out? You can't run dogs when you're in the middle of a storm, or do you? We do. Um, in the Iditarod this year, there were a couple of storms that we got into, and we couldn't see. The trail was totally blown in from the wind and the snow. Uh, we couldn't see to the next trail marker. So there are times when, when it can get dangerous out there. Um, and that's when you really have to have a special bond with your dogs and trust that they trust you and you trust them and you're going to make it. Because they can smell a way back? Or Quite often. Yes, they can smell. Even if the trail's totally buried, they can still feel the that difference. base underneath yeah, and smell it. Oh, interesting. It is. And what drew you uh, to this kind of passion? I think I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> For a long time. Exactly. Uh, when I was nine years old, my aunt and uncle met Joe Reddington, the yes. Iditarod founder. And they came back from Alaska. They'd just gone up there on vacation and they told me all about the Iditarod. I've never heard of it before. And for whatever reason, I said, I'm going to do that someday. It just it took over my life. I knew that's what I wanted to do. Did it, was it like lightning coming into you when you said you knew? What changed inside of you that raised that level from curiosity to commitment? Right. I think I had always had a passion for the outdoors. My family was very outdoor oriented and yeah. my dad built a log home from scratch himself. So I always had that um, kind of the yearning to have it a more simple lifestyle, I would yes. call it. Um, I always, when I was a little girl, I'd dress up like Laura Ingalls Wilder, and oh. I just love the, <laughs> the very basic lifestyle. Um, and so I think when I heard of sled dogs and traveling a thousand miles across this beautiful country, um, it reminded me of living in the 1800s. And that you could do time. now. Exactly. Yeah. Um, did you feel guided to this in any way? I believe that the Lord led me to this. Um, I just, it's 
it's been such a passion and he has opened all the doors to make it happen. So I truly believe that God placed this in my heart as a young girl. And what doors did you see open when you, you just mentioned that? What were you recalling? Uh, I would say, because I'd been bugging my parents for years to let me get a team of dogs and they kept oh, saying. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were an unusual child. I was, yes, <laughs> very different. <laughs> um, but I just had always asked them, you know, can I get a team of sled dogs? And they're like, someday when you get older, you can have as many dogs as you want. And um, it just so happened my mom was at work one day and talking to a coworker, and this man said, we know some people that are sled dog racers that live in northern Michigan. You should go and talk to them. Um, and we didn't even have their full name. We had a last name, which turned out it wasn't even their last name. And we drove up north one day and we found this couple, um, just kind of all fell together. And that day uh, they invited me to come train with them and it wasn't oh. long and I had my own team of dogs. What have the dogs taught you? They have taught me um, patience, um, just working with them and raising them and training them. You have to be patient with them. You have to love them and treat them with respect. Um, and they've also taught me that I should be more like them. Dogs just want to be loved. Uh, they just want to please and just be friends with everyone they come across, make them smile. And, and I hope someday I could be more like my dogs, just to be open to loving whoever's going to love them. That's really beautiful. <laughs> Did you become a stronger person? I mean, just the work that you had to do. Um, I always think life changes us. We choose it or not, life changes us. Mm -hmm. So do you think that a view that you changed, certain parts of your personality got more emphasized, certain parts of your, I wouldn't really say value system, but um, how you saw yourself in life? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think so. As a young girl, I was very shy and timid and didn't have a lot of self-confidence. Um, and I think with the dogs, just, just the responsibility of owning them and caring for them and then preparing a race team to compete in something uh, <laughs> <laughs> from my very first four-mile race to now a thousand-mile race, you just really grow in that dedication that it takes. and. Um, just the obstacles, even a, in a 30-mile race that you have to overcome, you know, to learn to take care of the dogs and to take care of yourself while you're out in the middle of nowhere because if something happens, you have to deal with it. There's not somebody waiting to come get you, and you just have to, to be how, strong. How do you do pacing of, of drinking water or gator or whatever you do that. Oh, hi. Uh, general nutrition and elimination. How do you sequence that, or do you just wait for the rest stops? Uh, I should. I need to get better at it yeah. <laughs> uh, because I do. I get a lot of adrenaline going, and then I yes. forget to take care of myself because I'm so focused on the dogs. Uh, this year in the Iditarod, it was very warm. It was unusually warm out there, so I think naturally it was easier for me to stay hydrated because yes. I was getting warm, so I wanted to drink cold water um, or Gatorade. But definitely at those checkpoints, that's where we really hydrate and, and eat our food. That's when we can take a few minutes to just take care of ourselves and, and focus on that. I, I'm really amazed at the... Um, you say, uh, like we were talking beforehand, you're driving this truck out by yourself with the dogs. Uh -huh. I'm surprised your mother let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> At that age, anyway. Um, and I think you gain a confidence out of being in nature and handling things that you don't get in a schoolroom necessarily. Definitely. At all. Right. Well, life gives you that anyway. Right. Uh, would, if you could teach that to s students of nine years old or 12 years old or f 15 years old, how would you do that other than going out and saying you've got to do it? Uh -huh. Can it be taught? Right. Um, I mean, so much of it you just do have to go and experience, but yes. I think just relaying, you know, some of the obstacles that maybe I've overcome out there, you know, um, especially in a race like the Iditarod, there's so many different elements that are thrown at you with the nature and, and the trail. Um, that I think just sharing some of those stories can really 
maybe inspire others or, or teach them, hey, there's, there's a lot that can happen out there and, and you can be changed by it. For the better. For the better, definitely, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Yes, well, what I was thinking of, uh, uh, people sometimes a little bit, um, not pessimistic now, but not as buoyant as you are <laughs> about what you're doing. And to be able to give that gift to, to other people, it doesn't have, they don't have to be out with dogs, mm -hmm. but, uh, or to search for that so that they can live full out is so um, helpful. And, um, you know, I, I wondered, I really wondered if you had never, your aunt and uncle had never come back, what, you know, like we were talking, what might you have done? Right. And you can't ever know that, exactly. but it's, uh, um, do you have to do anything um, to protect your health while you're out there? Um, I wouldn't say anything in particular. Um, just trying to, again, eating and drinking is key. And, right. And um, if you can stay strong, then you're better able to take care of the dogs. Um, but there's always unknowns, you know, the trail, if something happens and you, you tip over on the sled, you That's know, you just good. never know what could happen. Do you do weightlifting or any of that to work certain parts of your body <laughs> that everybody else does? Right. I really don't. Um, just working with the dogs, dogs is, is so physically demanding. Um, I mean, we're carrying, you know, five gallon water buckets or food buckets all the time to feed so many dogs. Um, as we're training with the dogs, a lot of times I'll get off the sled and I'll run up hills so the dogs don't have to carry my weight up the hill. So as I build their endurance. How loving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to help them out. Uh, but you kind of build, I think, as the dogs build because you're working them up and you're also building your own stamina. So what would be a, a training course for them when you say you have to build it? How do you do that? What would be a morning program? Right. So when we start in the fall, like this time of year, we've just gotten started with our serious training. Right. Uh, of course, we don't have snow right now, so we actually hook the dogs up to four-wheelers, all-terrain oh. vehicles, and have yes. them run that way. Um, we'll start out at, we're doing three and a half miles right now, and then just gradually bump them up in distance like a marathon runner would do. Um, by December, January, we might be doing runs as long as 80 miles at a time. Just go out pretty much nonstop 80 mile runs. So it's incredible what these dogs are But breaking of. along the way, you just don't go out and do 80 miles, do you? We'll do <laughs> short little. <laughs> About every two hours, I'll yeah. stop. I'll give them a little chunk of meat to keep calories going in, but we're only stopped for a few minutes, and then we're off again. So it is pretty much a nonstop 80-mile run. A couple minute breaks here and there, but it's So going forward for the next five, 10 years, mm -hmm. I always read that Iditarod was like the most demanding race. Are there others or not? There's another race, it's called the Yukon Quest. Um, it's very similar to the Iditarod, um, just a little bit shorter in mileage, but right close to a thousand miles. Um, it's considered to be a very tough race as well. Um, and so that's a possibility. My husband would really like to run that race, so he might get the opportunity to steal the race. Is team. he on the sled with you, or it's always one person? Always one person, yeah. So he's got his own races to run. He does. What he wishes. Exactly. Yeah, but because it takes so much to get to the Iditarod, we're pretty much focused on training all of the dogs for that. Yes. So he just helps me train the, all of our dogs, and then come race time, I'll just pick the strongest, healthiest to go with us. What a loving man. He is. He's amazing. Tell me about him. Uh, he is from Idaho originally and went to Juneau to go to college and happened to pick up a summer job working at one of these sled dog tour operations and never worked with sled dogs before and fell in love with it. Um, and when I moved up to Alaska, he had done the summer tours, but he'd never done any winter dog sledding. And so I invited him to come and, and train with me for a little while and we fell in love and <laughs> went from there. What a team. <laughs> yes. I'm very blessed. After the Iditarod, do you just see yourself continuing doing that, or are there other steps that suddenly you have a notion to try? Mm -hmm. um, the Iditarod, I just loved it so much, just the emotions that you go through out there, and it's, it's like you're discovering life that many people never get to see. It's just so raw. 
Um, it's so, so different from anything I could ever have imagined. Yes. Uh, and so I would just love to continue to focus on that race. I have a heart for the native villages that we go through out there and the people that live there. And I would love to somehow incorporate my racing into contributing and giving back to these villages in some way. I haven't figured out how yet. Good for you. But I would love to do that. Um, do your parents come out and see you at all? They do. They came out for the Iditarod. So oh, they do there. they? Yeah. <laughs> they were at the start and finish line. So that was awesome. They must be super proud of you. They are. They must be shocked, too. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to raise children, what would you, what, you what, what from what your parents taught you would you like to pass on? I would say the biggest thing would be love. Uh, my parents, I mean, they're my best friends. Um, they have given so much, and especially in this whole chasing the dream of running the Iditarod, I mean, there aren't many parents who would say, okay, you can have 30 dogs in our backyard and let's, let's go train. Um, so just the love and the commitment that they had to me and to my dreams. Uh, if I ever had children, I could never be as good of a mother um, or m as, as good as my father was. Um, but I would hope that I could, could pass some of that on to them. That, you know, that's really moving. Um, the involvement level is so moving. Definitely. Right. The expense level is, yes. so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> is so moving. Um, they're really interesting. That's really, I met your mother earlier, as you know, <laughs> darling, wonderful woman. She is. And um, I wonder, is she, has she been in education at all? She has not, no. She'd be a wonderful educator. I think so. Uh, she Good communicates teacher. really love and clarity. Yes. Yes. So who are the other mushers up there? What kind of people are they? Uh -huh. All works of life? Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely what? You, you see a little bit of everything. Um, some of these mushers are so kind and giving, and they want to share everything they know with you. And then, of course, like any competitive sport, some are, are very closed, and they stay to themselves, and they don't want to share much. Um, you just see people from all walks of life that are doing this. Are their dogs different, the people who don't want to share? They are, yes, yeah. Just a little more, I think, um, I don't know how to say it, just competitive. Yes. But different. I often wondered how much, you know, I told you it's interesting in the interspecies communication. And I often wondered how much of the pack leader or the human influences the personalities of the dogs versus the reverse way. And I, I think trainers would say, well, totally. Oh, but I think it's beyond that. You know, that they, they pick some, up some, some, it's like the culture of the tribe or something like that. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think with my dogs, because we've raised most of them, there's just, there's a connection there. We understand each other. Um, and even a part of the Iditarod this year, I had gotten very exhausted and I was mentally, I was fried. And I had gotten in a kind of weird place and I was scared out there. And one of my dogs started acting very strange. I'm um, just looking around like he was scared and I'm sure he was picking up on my emotions. He, he was feeling what I was feeling. Oh, that is so interesting. It is. That is really interesting and seeing him reminded you that you had a bigger role to play exactly. than just being locked into yourself All right you know it reminds me of a story my grandmother wrote a buckboard and she wrote it too fast and she had her two young tots in it my late uncles and um, so it turned over the horses bolted and oh, wow. turned her over and she threw herself under the children, so they would fall on her uh -huh. and not be hit by a wheel or whatever happened mm -hmm. um, from the rocks or the, the gravel on the road. And I often think that when you get like a nervous dog or my grandmother, that the best of you comes forward, Definitely. right? Definitely. And you can, all that training, all that love, all that practice, all that value system is in that split decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So here, we've learned a tremendous lot, but not necessarily, um, 
just how to do it, but with what to do it. Uh, Shawnee has had a wonderful childhood, as she said, and um, because it was based on love and support of what it is she wanted to do, and that she learned from her dogs, above all, to be the kind of person she hopes to be, which is they live friendliness, and they live love, and they live willingness to please. And if we could just live at that kind of, um, or what do I want to say, rhythm, it would be so much uh, better for all. And we got into talking, is there a community, because I'm interested in it, communication between animal and human. And she started to say when she was in a, you know, a hard time during the race, her dog started to get nervous. And I think, you know, we all teach each other, so whether we're, we're dogs or human beings, that may sound really bad. So as you go forward, remember to do something nice for someone, someone kind. Be the good person that you'd like to meet. And remember to have curiosity and understand where other people are in life or animals are in life. Because when you live in that love quadrant or that love center, it's just easier. And respect that sometimes you get divine guidance and accept it and give it and live it and be good. And I will see you next time. And thank you so, so much for choosing. And it's always a pleasure to be with you. And I hope you feel the same. So thank you. And thank you, Sean. Thank you so I much. I loved it. I just uh, loved it. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.